Okay, so we should be we should be going. I hope we're going. Okay. I just got a link. Yes, very good, very good. Yes, okay, we're live. <laughs> I will just start over then. I'm very um very sorry about the little delay here. My name is WFM Ellen Nilsson. Uh, I am from Denmark and today we're going to be talking a little bit about weak and strong playing on weak and strong squares. We're both live on Coaches Twitch and we're live on Chess24. I have the live chat here with me on my phone on YouTube and then I have the Coaches Coaches Twitch chat room on my laptop, which means that I will be reading your comments and trying to answer them as well as I can uh, here during uh, the hour we're going to spend together. So if you do have any questions, anything you're doubting, then please let me know. We don't want anyone to go home confused about today. The first game we're going to look at here is a bit of a classic. It is Jan Timman against Nigel Short in 1991. Um, but before we start with the game, I would like to first try to define what a weak square is to the viewer. Max Erve, I think that's how you pronounce it. He was a world chess champion from 1935 to 1937. And he said, by a weak square, we mean one in or near one's own territory, which can in the long run be occupied by a hostile piece. And this basically means that a weak square is one which cannot be defended by a pawn and which you can um, exploit. If your opponent has a weak square, then the square is weak if you can exploit that it's weak. In this position, um, there is a lot to talk about. We s that was not my intention, no. <laughs> we see here that black's pawns on the king side, they are all displayed on white squares. And that means that the dark squares around the kings, they have no defenders. Besides that, black only has a light squared bishop over here. We see it pointing down on the a8 h1 diagonal, but no dark squared bishop which means that black's king is very vulnerable. There's no dark squared bishop to protect the weak dark squares. And the pawns in this game, they cannot go back. I think in this position, that's a lot of arrows, I'm so sorry. I think in this position, black would be happy if he could take this pawn on g6, move it back to h7 and take this pawn on h5 and move it back to h7. Because then these weak squares on h8 and f6 they wouldn't be weak because these squares they can never again be defended by a pawn that was a red arrow and that was also a red arrow and those are red squares yes in this game or in this exact position we also see that on the queen side white has split pawns on c2 c4 and a4 which means that the that white dark squares on the queen side, they are very weak. But in this position, black cannot really do anything to exploit these squares as all the action is on the king side. And there's a funny story connected to this game also, which was that this is the third, this is the 40th move that white had to make in this position. Uh, and Jan Timman, he, he didn't really uh, he didn't really know what to do and oftentimes when you play a classical game of chess you have one minute one hour and 30 minutes for the th first 40 moves and then after 40 moves you get an additional half hour and Jan Timan he really wanted to get the additional 30 minutes in this position so he just made a move he just played king h2 in this position because then he was at move 40 and he could really spend time to think um, something we can see here is that white pieces, they are very active. The knight on f3 is very well protected, um, covering for 
let me see if I can draw her an arrow. Covering for the mate on g2. If this knight went to g5, um, arrows, yes, very good. If this knight <laughs> went to g5 to go for to go further and try to attack the black king, then it would be made in one, which wouldn't be very nice. So the knight on f3 is actually very well placed. Besides that, the rooks, they are controlling the d-file completely. Black cannot in any way contest the d-file, as that would just blunder a rook after rook takes, rook takes. And here we will see a mate on h8. So. Black cannot contest white's activity on the d-file and here black decided to just play rook c8 to make, to make some kind of move. Another idea black could have had could have been taking this pawn, but now black is no longer threatening a mate here on g2, which means that white can bring the last piece into the attack with knight g5. And in this position, it will actually uh, be very, very close to mate, as white's pieces are so active. We see white has three attackers on the f7 pawn, and black only has two defenders, and the pawn will fall quite soon. If black tries to go back to again threaten the mate, then the knight on g5 won't go back. Then white will play f3 in this position, which will also be covering the mate. So... Nigel Short, he decided to not take the pawn on a4, as he could see that it would lead to immediate destruction of his position. He decided to just play a waiting move in this position. Come on. <laughs> in this position, he played rook c8. He hadn't foreseen white's plan, and as we heard, white actually hadn't foreseen his plan either. It was only at this moment that he was trying to think which of my pieces are ideally placed. And he actually found out that all of his pieces are ideally placed. The queen on f6 is taking all the dark squares away from black. The rooks are very, very active on the d-file and the knight on f3 is protecting the mate. So the only, piece which, the only piece which can actually be improved in this position is the king on h2. And in this position, white played king g3. And now we can actually begin to see what White's plan is. He's going to try to exploit the weak dark squares around Black's king. There was nothing much for Black to do here. Um, <laughs> he's actually just gonna get mated, even though we have an equal material on the board. He moved his rook back from c8 to e8, and then came king f4. After bishop c8, he was trying to attack the rook here on d7, but it was actually already too late. And after king g5, black simply just had to resign. We can see that no matter which move black makes, this will be made. And <laughs> it's actually a very, very cute mate, because if black tries something like there we go. If black tries something like king h7 here, then there is a very nice move. A queen g6 or a queen takes g6. The king has to go back to h8. And in this position, you almost win the same way as you would have won in the game. There is queen h6 check here and the black king can only go to g8. And here we see king f6. There is no checks against the king on f6. It's standing completely safe on, on the square directly in black's camp. And the next move we will see a mate on g7. So black cannot play king h7. White's idea in this position is of course to play king h6. And then there will be a mate on g7 to come. So king h7 to protect that does not work and so does no other moves. The only thing black can do here is try to delay the mate. Let's say he takes on f3, on, on d7, then white can play king h6 and there's no way to stop the mate on g7. So here we see a very classic example of a way 
<laughs> okay, uh, queen f3. Then you take back with the g-pawn <laughs> to keep your queen on f6 and you go king h6 in the next move. Um, I'm hoping that I... I'm looking at chat and I'm not really seeing any questions, so I'm hoping that it's not because I'm I'm missing something uh, something here. I hope that I have it set all up correctly. But here we this is a very classic uh, example of how to uh, exploit the weak squares in in a weakened king position. The dark squares are very, very weak and there is no dark squared bishop to protect them. So white just won this game very, very convincingly. Um, classic, classic example. And if you can, if you can remember this, then it, this is something you should try to remember for the rest of your life. Yes, it is indeed uh, Jan Timman against Nigel Short from 1991. If we try to move on to the next game we have here today, this is a game between Akiva Rubenstein and Rudolf Spielmann. And here we see some of, uh, let me just see if I can flip the board. Here we see some of the same problems for, but this time for the white side. The white side does not have a light squared bishop and all of white's pawns are placed on dark squares which means that they can never protect the light squares here again. Besides that, black has a very prominent pawn here on h3, which is really a thorn in white side, taking complete control over this g2 square. White al black also has a light squared bishop, taking all of the white squares on in white's king position. This bishop on f2 is very blocked, firstly by the pawns on h2, g3 and f4. And besides that, it can't go to d4 as this square is well protected by black. And going to e3 does not help much. It is also, uh, it is also black to move here, but this bishop does not have much scope. If we try to imagine this bishop being on h1 instead, then the light squares, they wouldn't be as weak and the bishop would have some more squares to point at. In this position, let's just try to remove these. Yes, very good. No, cannot do that. In this position, black played a really, really strong move. Black played bishop g2. And here we can see that the queen on f1 is actually trapped. It cannot go to e2 as the rook is covering that square. It cannot go to d3 as the queen is covering that square. I'm not very good with the arrows here, I'm so sorry. Um, and it cannot take on g2 as this pawn is protecting uh, the bishop. So the only move in this position that white can really make is rook takes e8. If black played rook takes e8 back, then the queen would be able to move to d1 no longer being trapped. In this position, black is also winning, but he has to show that he can exploit the weak, the weak white squares around the king, um, because he, he didn't win a queen here. But after, after rook takes e8, then again, black played a very, very strong move. Bishop takes f1. If rook takes f1 and rook takes e8, black is simply just down a queen for a piece and this will be made very very quickly. The queen will go to the queen will go to g4. <laughs> These arrows. The queen will go to g4, then it will go to f3 and there will be a mate on g2 and this is actually very difficult for white to stop. So after bishop takes f1, then black had to take the rook on a8. And here we see quite a common uh, imbalance. White has two rooks for a queen. And some people, they say that two rooks are better than a queen, um, but it's really all about the position. And in this position, 
the white king is so weak and the light squares around that king, they are so weak that black is actually just clearly winning in this position. It will be very, very difficult for a white to avoid mate. So in this position, yeah, and also the queen is such a great attacking piece um, in positions like this. This is a very common plan. Um, but in this position, white, black played queen d3 with the exact same plan. He wants to go to f3 and mate on g2. Uh, yes, we can also... I will also give some positions where I will uh, ask chat to find the moves. I just wanted to show some examples before I did that. As often when you have a theme, then it's very difficult finding uh, the right move if you haven't seen the theme before. Like if you had to find uh, a special kind of mate, then it it would be very difficult to find if you hadn't seen the theme before, like a queen sacrifice, for example, because you don't often do queen sacrifices. So I wanted to show a bit of examples first before I gave chat some uh, some positions to try to solve. Uh, what about bishop takes c3 followed by queen e4 instead? That's a very valid question. Uh, in this position, Black could consider playing bishop takes c3. Um, but after rook takes c3 and queen e4, uh, this is also winning, maybe. But here, here white lost, uh, here white lost a piece compared to the other, uh, the other position. Um, you have to, after bishop takes c3 and rook takes c3, you have to move the, the bishop first or actually play queen b1 in this position. This will lead to mate very soon. You're threatening to move the bishop here uh, with check and mate to come. Um, after king takes f1 in this position, then queen d3 check would be winning as the king can only go back to uh, to g1 and after queen f3 there is no way to prevent mate on g2. Um, the king can go here but after a check on h1 and the king moves then the rook is hanging um, and this is actually very close to what we will see in the game so I will uh, I will go away from that one. In this position Black played queen d3, and white decided to ring, bring his book, bring his rook back with rook e8. Black played queen f3, threatening mate. In this position, if white decides to take, in this position before rook e8, if white decides to take the bishop with rook takes f1, then black has queen f3 and mate will follow on the next move. There is no way for white to protect the g2 square. So white played rook e8 and here black found another very good move, queen f3. Again, if you take on f1 with the rook, there will be a mate on g2. Um, and the only way you can run away from the mate is by playing king takes f1. After king takes f1, queen h1 was played. If we see king e2, then the rook on c1 is hanging. So instead, bishop g1, but after queen, g3, queen g2 check, black will also pick up the bishop um, because white cannot go to any of the squares on the second rank. So he has to move along the first rank and then the bishop will be hanging. White played king takes d, king d2 and then black plays queen takes h2. And in this position, white simply just had to resign. This pawn on h3, which we saw in the beginning was a thorn in black side on the light squares, will now be a thorn in black side because it will actually go down and promote to be a queen. So once again, if we go back to the starting position, 
then we see how important it is to have a to have a safe king as the light squares were the reason that black ended up that black ended up mating white because there was no way for white to protect the light squares if he had had a light squared bishop on h1 and this bishop had been to been to d7 not being as actively placed then white will also struggle but there definitely would not be an immediate mate the next game i will give as an exercise that was what uh, what was requested so if we start here then firstly i will um i will do a bit of explaining before you can try to to find some good moves in this position there's a black pawn missing on g7 black doesn't have a pawn here which means that the dark square is around his king if i could yeah arrows very good okay okay there we go which means that the black squares around the king they are very weakened and white will be able to use the g file as a source of attack in this position um, and with that being said in this position we do see the queen on e7 doing a very well job of protecting some of these very important dark squares but with that being said then let's try to spend two minutes to try to find some ideas here for black uh for for white to checkmate black um yeah let's take two minutes there are some suggestions already one thing i suggest when uh when calculating and trying to find uh, a win in a position like this is that you always look for ways that your opponent can defend him or herself and oftentimes uh, you have to be looking at the forcing variations first as they are a bit easier to calculate and a forcing variation is a variation where you make a move and then it's difficult to impossible for your opponent to react in in another way that uh, that you want them to for example you can also as being suggested try to make some candidate moves instead of just looking at one move and trying to calculate that one then try to come up with a few different moves and go through them And very good. So we also see in chat that uh, that people are finding defenses for for certain moves. I think we'll just take one minute more in this position. This is by no means an easy position to uh, calculate. Uh, the game was played between Daniel Harvitz and Joseph Sen. I don't remember which year. I think it was 19, 1935. So it's a very old game. Okay, and I, I see the right first move in chat here. So let's just take that one first. This position is completely winning for white and there's many ways to win. Um, but White found a, found a very nice way to finish the game here. Um, Queen h6 was being suggested by chat. So if we try to go through that one first. After Queen h6, it's very important here to look for defenses for black. And in this position, one reasonable defense is to play f6. And f6 has... Um, f6 is good because it's protecting the g7 square so after a move like rook g3 and king h8 then there's no immediate mate on 
on g7 and the queen is also protecting the rook on f8. So here there would still be some work to do for, uh, for white. But as also suggested, then rook e1 in, in this position, rook e1 was a very, very nice move. Um, <laughs> okay, yes, it's also true that you should be very careful uh, about moves like f6, but in this, in the position we had just before, after queen h6, then f6 was a very important move because it is completely vital that black defends the dark squares around his king. Here white found the nice move rook e1. Um, and black has to protect all the weak dark squares with his uh, with his queen. A move in this position like queen d7 would just immediately run into rook g3, king h8 and queen f6 checkmate. So black has to black has to oops, that was not intentional. Black has to defend the dark squares. And the way for black to defend those squares is by playing queen d8. But here but now <laughs> now white found the very nice way Queen h6 would be uh, would be a good move, but in this position you have to be a bit mindful. Queen c7 here protects the g3 square, so you still have to find the mate here. Um, and there is a mate after the rook here moves to e3, but it's, there's a much easier way for white to do it in this position, and that is by playing rook g3 check first. Black can put his queen on g5, but as white would just be able to take it, then let's say black moves his king to h8. And now we have the move queen h6. It threatens the g7 square. Uh, this queen has to keep on protecting the f6 square, as uh, it would be an immediate mate, as we saw in the other variation. And there's really only one move here for black to protect the g7 square to avoid getting mated, and that's rook g8. And then in this position, we have a very, very, very beautiful move played by, played by white. I don't know if anyone has seen this game before, but if you haven't, then this is a very, very good, uh, good trick to know. I'll probably give you a few minutes to try to find it. Aha, there was al <laughs> there was already one who was uh who's quick in chat there. We have some we have some people who who can calculate quite well here today. So, in this position, rook let me just get that one in. In this position, rook e8 is the devastating move. There is nothing for here, nothing for black to do here. If black moves this rook and takes on e8, then there would be the beautiful mate on g7. And if black decides to take with the queen, then we will see the mate with queen f6, rook g7, and queen takes g7. This kind of mood, this kind of move here is also called deflection. You try to remove the piece which is protecting the important squares. And here the important squares are the dark squares. Let's try to imagine that black just wanted, was fine by giving the queen, just knight d7. But here, Another nice move, which isn't uh, which isn't too difficult to see, but it's still it's still not what you would expect. Usually, you just think, "Oh, I will take the queen, I will be a queen up, and I will be very happy." But there's something much better in this position, and that is queen g7 checkmate in one. 
because this rook on g8 is pinned. The rook cannot take the queen on g7 as the king would then be hanging. So this move is simply just checkmate in one. And it's actually, it's very, I find it very, very beautiful. So now we've had a few examples. And then I will be showing a game of my own. Because sometimes you do... <laughs> You do play normal chess games, and in these chess games, the very same things, they happen. You have to be very careful about the weak squares around your king, um, which is what we will see here. In all these examples we've seen so far, we've only seen examples where one player had a queen on the board. But even when there's no queens, you still have to be careful um, about your king, because the king is in the end, the most important piece on the chessboard. This is move 17 of the game. I am white playing against a Norwegian WIM. In this position, I have this very, very nice pawn on f6 and I took black's pawn on g7, trying to ruin black's king struck uh, king position here and I'm also threatening the pawn here on h6 which, which means that really black is almost forced to take this pawn as she would otherwise lose the pawn on h6 and now we see uh, the reoccurring theme here today that the dark squares the dark yes please yes the dark squares around the king they have been weakened and what's even more important here is that I'm sitting with this dark squared bishop. And this dark squared bishop will be able to attack this king later in the game. We can, for example, firstly look at the a1 to h8 diagonal. If this bishop managed to come onto here, then it will be very, very difficult for white. Right now, this knight on c6 is doing a very good job protecting that square. Um, arrows. Yes, there we go. In this position, I started by taking a pawn, just simply taking a pawn here on c7. And when my bishop was threatened, I moved the bishop back. My opponent tried to get some counterplay by playing rook b7, attacking my pawn here on b2. But sometimes when you're on the attacking side, pawns, they actually do not matter that much. I'm a pawn up in this position, but if you want to mate your opponent, you have to bring all your pieces into game, into the game. And I, uh, I play knight e4. Knight e4 is with the idea of firstly attacking this d6 square. If my opponent made a move like a5, then I would have a knight d6, a fork on the two rooks. So black has to do something about that. Secondly, it's also taking, it's also attacking this f6 square, the weak dark square. And it will have even more devastating effect if I manage to get my bishop to e5, as f6 will never be able to be played. And then maybe afterwards I can try to establish my knight on f6. And the king will actually not have many squares to go to. So in this position, to avoid the knight d6 check, then uh, <laughs> check to the rooks, then my opponent, she took the pawn. She thought my position is not very good. At least I have to get some, um, get some material back here. And then you have to bring all your pieces into the party. I played rook e3. And as you can already see, it has been highlighted that my plan is to bring this rook from e3 to g3 and give a check to the king. Let's say, just to show my point here, let's say black played a move um, like a5 again. A completely useless move, which doesn't do anything good for black's position. Then I would get this rook g3 check. And if the king went to h7, then my knight would be able to establish itself on f6 with a check to the king. 
and attacking the rook also. And there we see why it's so important to, to have a pawn on g7. Um, especially in this case to protect the f6 square which has now been weakened. Another thing that that black really wants to do in this position is play a move like bishop f5. Because if black can get his bishop if black can get her bishop to f5 and then to g6, then at least she would be able to have some more cover for her king. But in this position it's not easy to play bishop f5 because knight d6 is coming. It is threatening the bishop and threatening the rook. So let's say black takes the rook. Then knight takes f5. This intermediate move is a check. And when the black king moves, then white can take the rook with... Uh, or I can take the rook with my knight. And I will end up being a piece up in this position, which would be completely winning. I have to also check this one. Okay. Um... So it's at this point it's not easy for for white for black to bring her bishop into the defense even though she wanted to. She played rook h8 in this position, which only which only highlights the threat of bishop to e5 even more. As now it's actually threatening both rooks, and again it wouldn't be able to play f6 as white has two pieces attacking that square. Let me just see with all these arrows. <laughs> um, the knight on c6 is protecting the e5 square. So it is not possible now. But it's very very important to keep in mind because what I decided to do was play against this knight on c6. Again it wouldn't work in this position playing bishop F no, that was the position we just had, sorry. Um, a better defensive move in this position would have been rook e8. Uh, rook g8, sorry. To try to give the king some more protection. And if after a move like rook g3, then black would play king h8 here. Trying to exchange one of white's attacking pieces for one of her own defensive pieces. Which would be a nice development for black. So rook g8 would have been better, but rook h8, she was trying to defend the pawn at h6, but it only makes my threats even stronger. I played rook d1. Once again, you have to bring all the pieces into it into the attack, especially if there is no queens on the board. Because the queen is a very, very good attacking piece, but here white needs a bit more pieces to attack. If white had had a queen, then it would be almost made but white doesn't so all the pieces into the attack here and finally black played bishop f5 she really wants to get this bishop to g6 because then it's not easy to see how white is going to be able to exploit this check um she could also because when i move my rook from a1 to d1 i am hanging the pawn on a2 and she could try to take it but here, rook d6 would be a very, very good move. What about rook d6 next? Yes, exactly. Eccentric horse. Um, if white took the pawn, then there would be rook d6 trying to kick the knight away. And we, we see how important this knight on c6 is. Let's say the knight moved to b4. Then finally the check on e5 would appear, winning the rook on h8 and in this case it's very very close to mate um, because white's pieces are, are so active and the squares around the dark squares around the king they are so weak she played bishop f5 and as it was also said in chat then rook d6 really just really playing against really playing against this knight and trying to get the bishop to e5 to exploit these rooks and the king. Um, if she took, if she took the bishop on e4, then after rook e4, the threats would be exactly the same, and f6 is still, let's say, the the knight 
let's give a check first. This check can actually be very useful for black as it takes the rook away from this b2 square so the bishop won't be able to threaten it. So after the check, the king can uh, move to, to h2. But once again, what is black supposed to do here? If uh, she moves the knight, then the check on e5 will come. And once again, f6 is not a move because now the rook on d6 is also attacking the f6 square. And after bishop takes, the rook on h8 will be lost in the next move. Um, and if she, if she didn't give the check and went knight b4, then bishop e5 would again either take the rook on b2 or the rook on h8. So she didn't take the knight on e4, instead she played rook b1 check. The useful check, the useful check to get out of the bishop e5 threat. I moved my king. Uh, the only move if I don't want to hang a piece here. And she played rook c8. And now she took her rook away from the defense of the c6 pawn because she couldn't find another way to keep the knight on c6 and also prevent the threat of bishop e5. But now she's hanging the pawn on h6. It actually it took me uh, it took me some while I it may sound a little bit strange right now but it took me some while to find bishop h6 because um, I didn't really realize how this rook on on d6 and the bishop on h6 they were both attacking the pawn um, because it's <laughs> it's not really uh, something you see every day. And now we are really, really starting to see the problems with the black king on g7 here. If king g8 in this position, if king g8, then knight f6 check. And the king cannot go to h7. The king cannot go to g7. It cannot go to f8. And the only move in this position is king h8. And I don't want to spoil anything here because we see... Um, we will see the exact same tactic in the game because here there is a very very beautiful tactic for white to play. In the game she played king h7 and knight g5 check. In this case if the knight went to f6 as it did in the other variation then that would be hanging, hanging the bishop on h6 as the rook is no longer able to protect it. Um, and I don't I don't really uh, want to hang my pieces, so instead I went knight g5 check. Again, these are the weak dark squares that I'm trying to exploit. And here the king cannot take the bishop on h6 because the rook is now defending. So the king has to move. The king has to move to h8 here or g8. If she goes to h8, then at the very least in this position, I can take this pawn on f7 with check. At the very, very least. Um, but there's also the same tactic as in the game. I just don't want to spoil it because in this position, there's a lot of winning moves for white here. But I will try to leave it up to, uh, to the viewers to try to, to find... Uh, a move in this position and then I will give you two minutes and then uh, you can you can write your answers in chat but also you might want to wait a little while with okay <laughs> you might want to wait a little while with doing it so that everyone they can get a chance to try to see um, or solve the position So if you're trying to solve the position, don't look in chat because I see some replies there. And yes, also it's being said that uh, this could be called chess harmony and we really do see the white pieces working well together here. The bishop is taking up all the weak squares, uh, the weak dark squares. The knight on g5 is protecting the h7 square. And the rook on the rooks on d6 and e3 are well into the attack. 
taking the the open files. I don't know if that's enough time spent. Maybe there's some people who need a little bit more time. How often do you actually think about, I'm strong on the dark squared, my opponent is not? It's actually very, very uh, often, in spe especially in this game, it was really important to, to think about, I'm really strong on the dark squares. Because something we also see in this position is that there are opposite colored bishops on the board. And very often when people, uh, they see opposite colored bishops, they think, oh, it's opposite colored bishops, it must be a draw. But the opposite colored bishop act bishops actually favor the attacking side. And here it's very, very obvious who is the attacker. And it's, and it's very obvious who is the attacker because of the king position and the, and the weak squares. Let's say that um, white was very weak on the light squares. Of course, in this position, white's pieces are so active and black's pieces are so passive that it wouldn't really matter. Um, because white would be first, but if if white was weak on the light squares and black was weak on the dark squares, then it's a matter about who can attack first and who's the quickest attacker. Um, but in this game, there simply is no doubt about it, uh, because black is so weak on the dark squares that the dark squares bishop really is more than ten times better than this light squared bishop. So I think we have given um, chat enough time. Did in the position before even work uh, rook g3? Uh -huh. Um I guess it's this position. So if there's some people still thinking, let's just take this first. In this position, rook g3 would also uh, be a very possible move. And then it's bishop g6, which is proposed as the defending move, trying to block this check. But here, uh, indeed, as it's being said, then rook g takes g6 is a very, very strong move. Um, you cannot take with the king because the rook is defending the other rook. So you have to take with the pawn. And then after a move like uh, rook d7 check, Actually, rook d7 check is the only winning move. Um, king h8, and then knight f6. If you go king g8 here, then knight f6, king f8, and bishop takes h6 check mate. And if you go king h8, then rook h7. And this constellation of pieces is actually what we call the Arabian mate. When the knight here is on f6 and the rook goes to either h7 or g7 and delivers checkmate. Um, but after rook h8, after king h8, then it's the same. Knight f6 and there is no way to stop this rook from coming to h7 and delivering checkmate. The only problem about this, uh, the only problem about this move is that you have to calculate it very accurately because you're sacrificing the exchange here on g6. So if it doesn't work, you've lost an exchange. And sometimes it can be difficult to calculate further. Whereas after bishop h6, you don't really need to calculate much because the attack continues. Um, and there's no way for, for black to stop it. But if we go to the position here, then as a lot of people, they did say, then rook takes c6 was the move to be played here. Um, let me just see if I can remove the arrows. Yes, because here in this position, if rook takes c6, then there's simply just rook e8 mate. And here my opponent resigned. She lost the piece. Um, the attack continues and she will get mated soon. She can't even take the rook as there will be a maiden one. I have also now we've gone through uh, now we've gone through some exercises and we have seen how important it is to protect your king. So I'm going to give a little exercise here to see if we have learned anything today. In this position, we have 
black to move and win. Hopefully we've learned something. And I'll just try to fix my camera here. So that it is focused. I often say that my camera is more focused than I am. So in this position, once again, we have to consider which are the weak squares. And compared to the other examples and games we've looked at today, then this pawn on f3 is actually protecting, uh, protecting white quite well. Um, but there are still some problems on the light squares here. These light squares are just completely weakened. Um, and I don't want to say much more because if I try to, if I if I say much more, then probably it will be a bit easier to find. And I saw this exercise posted by Fide on Facebook. It was uh, Daniel Duboff who had given it to a, a bunch of uh, kids in the Moscow uh, chess club. Chess club in Moscow. He was giving he was answering some of their questions and giving a lecture. And I, I thought this exercise was very, very fitting for today. I'll just, uh, the people who haven't yet solved it, I will give a few minutes more so that everyone, they can be sure that they have it. I think we are getting there. There's also a lot of people who have shown that they do know uh, the right move in this position. And the right move is indeed... <laughs> Come on. The right move is indeed bishop g2 in this position, really taking advantage of the weak light squares. And now, if we hadn't seen it before, we definitely do see now how this queen will come into the attack, just pointing directly at h3. Let's imagine that white takes the bishop here on g2. That seems to be the most logical move in some way. Then queen h3 check. The king cannot run to f1. So the king has to go back to g1. But after queen h1, this rook here is really just doing its best to help the queen checkmating uh, the white player. And if... Oops. Oops. Come on. Can I... Thank you. And if white decides to not take the bishop, let's say white takes this pawn here on, on b7, then don't get tempted. <laughs> Don't get tempted and take the queen here because white will take the rook on a8 and promote to a queen. And then there's a bit further to the mate. White is much better in this position. Don't get tempted. Just find the winning move here. And the winning move is uh, very close to what we saw before. We really want, we really, really want white to take this bishop because then the queen can come in with a check and join the attack. So as being said in chat, rook h1 check. And the king has to take the bishop on g2. There is simply no other move in the position. And after queen h3, it is just made on the board. Um, so I thought this exercise was very, very fitting um, as a final exercise of the day. And then uh, we went a bit over time here because there was some difficulties with streaming today from several websites. 
So I wanted to spend the last five minutes here uh, asking if anyone had any questions uh, about anything in chess, if they had any suggestions, if they had any feedback, if they had any doubts about something earlier, if they wanted something repeated, then now is the time to, to ask. And I will be, uh, I will be reading both chats here. Calvin, <laughs> thank you so much. Isn't Queen H2 made as well? Um, Queen H2, I guess that's in this position after King takes, oops, in this position after, aha, Queen H3. Oh, after CB7 and Queen H3. Well, this is not a forced variation. And that means that, first of all, this white king here can't move. Um, but rook h1, rook h1 is a forced variation, which means that there's nothing white can do in this position. He has to take the bishop and then queen h3 will be made. If you, if you try to play queen h3 first, then it's very difficult for white to prevent this mate on h1. But there is this little move, taking on a8, taking the rook on a8 with a check. And now uh, black actually has to be careful because you can only move the king. And if you haven't calculated this through, then you're not going to mate. And there actually isn't a, a mate in this position here. Um, white will play queen f3, uh, queen c3 check. And after f6, then taking this... Um, this uh, rook on h8 with check. This is a very long uh, variation. So if if queen takes, then there's king takes g2. And white is just two rooks up. And if rook takes, then there's a very, very pretty move in this position. Um, and that the, that's the only move which, just, which, which doesn't lose the game. And that's queen c8 check. If the king moves... Then the queen will take on h3 and black is busted. So the queen has to take and then after king takes g2 there's no more mate and you have to you have to play queen against two rooks and and white is unfortunately much better in this position. Um, so you have you have to try to look for the forcing variations. The forcing variations are usually the captures, the checks are the most the most <laughs> the checks are the most forcing, and then comes the captures. Um, who do you think is the greatest modern chess world champion? Well, it's very difficult not to say Magnus, isn't it? <laughs> um, would you rather start a game without a queen or without three pieces? Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. You know, um, for such imbalances like uh, queen against three pieces or queen against two rooks, it often really um, def depends on on the position. If you had asked me about queen, uh, if I would rather start without a queen or without two rooks, I would say I would rather start without two rooks because in the opening position, the rooks, they're not able to... Uh, the rooks are not able to to shine to show their full potential. They need some uh, they need some open files, for example, to exploit, and it's very difficult for them to get it quickly in the opening position. I don't know about uh, queen or three pieces. I think might might be the queen because the queen is uh, queen is quicker in the opening position, and the pieces they need some time to coordinate. Um, who is better in this position, white or black, the one on the board right now? White is better in this position because the queen needs some some weaknesses to attack. And in this position, it's not easy for the queen to attack um, anything because 
the rooks they're very very good at defending in exactly this position and the rooks they have the open files here um white would need to create some counterplay or create some weaknesses with the pawns um maybe an attack against the king because the queen is a good attacking piece but it's not really possible to create uh, an attack in this position which actually makes this position close to winning for white <laughs> did you say magnus because you're in chess 24 no uh i'm serious i think he's he's quite decent yeah um is the bishop pair as good as people say it depends on the position but yes very often the bishop pair is preferable um who is the best woman chess player ever judith polgar no doubt about that one i i'm gonna need to read her books unfortunately i i haven't done it yet <laughs> who are you reading for in the candidates okay there's so many so many questions i think uh the candidates will be very very excited exciting to watch and i cannot wait for it to start again um but i think that was it for today i hope that you have enjoyed this little lecture uh where i try to specify in weak squares around the king and how to exploit them my feeder rating is 2200 uh, 2209 to be exactly. Um, but I hope you feel like you have learned something today. Don't forget to go and check out uh, coaches.com or Julius Bear, the education partner here. Um, <laughs> yes, I don't know what more to say. Thank you so much for today. Uh, I have enjoyed it a lot and I, I hope that you have as well. So that's it for me. Bye bye.